All right. Thank you, Barsh. It's a pleasure to talk at this seminar. Thanks to the uh, organizers for inviting me to speak here. So the, the, topic of the topic of today's talk will be some quantitative properties of periodic orbits for area preserving diffeomorphisms of a closed surface. So the just to fix so just to fix some notation throughout the talk we'll we'll work on a closed connected oriented surface sigma and we'll fix on sigma an area form omega, which I'm going to normalize to have area one. And as I said, the main topic of the talk are area preserving diffeomorphisms. So I'll use this notation, diff of sigma omega, to denote diffeomorphisms of sigma preserving the area form omega. And Within the diffeomorph this group of diffeomorphisms is a very large subgroup of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So these are any diffeomorphism that can be realized as the time one map uh, of associated to the flow of an S1 time dependent Hamiltonian. Now to state the main results, I need to write down some more notation regarding orbit regarding orbit sets of of these maps. So so let me just fix some area preserving map phi. Now an orbit set is going to be, which I'll generally denote by the letter O, is going to be the following finite, is going to be the following finite formal sum. So it's going to be a formal sum over simple periodic orbits S sub K. So each, each, each S sub K is a simple periodic orbit of phi, which geometrically it's just a finite set of points in your surface, which are permuted, which are permuted by phi. And each of these A sub K denotes a positive real coefficient. Okay. And we're, we're, if we're given any periodic orbit S, I'll use this absolute value sign to denote its period. And correspondingly, if I have an orbit set O as above, I'll write absolute value of O for the sum, for the weighted sum over the periods of all its component orbits. So more explicitly, this is gonna be the sum over k of a sub k times the period of s sub k. Okay. And then another piece of notation that I'll need to introduce is if I have some function sig, some just some real valued function on the surface, call it f, then I'm going to write s of f for the sum of f over s. So this is just the, the sum of the values of f over all the points in this orbit s. And correspondingly, if I have an orbit set O, then O of f will be what you expect. It's going to be the sum of a sub k times s sub k of f. OK. So with this notation in mind, now I can tell you what it, what it means to have an equidistributed sequence of orbit sets. So, this is a little... so let me fix some sequence OJ. And we say this is equidistributed if the following thing holds. So if, if, we, fix, if we fix any smooth function F on sigma, then we want then we want the following identity to hold. Uh, 
OK, so on the right-hand side, all I've written down is the integral of f over the surface. On the left-hand side, each of these terms are the following fraction. It's the sum of f over the orbit set O of j divided by the total size of O of j. So in other words, it's just the average of f over the orbit set. So what this, so we say that the, this sequence of orbit sets O of j is equally distributed if just the averages of any smooth function converge over the orbit sets converge to the integral of said smooth function. So this, this identity tells you a lot of things. Like from a very, a very qualitative description is that you can get from this identity is just that the orbit sets kind of, you know, fill up the, that the orbit sets geometrically fill up the entire surface evenly. Hence the term equidistributed. I think a, a good example of this is if you take say F to be the characteristic function of some open set. Or some or some smoothing thereof. Okay, so with that in mind, now I can state the main theorems of the talk. So what we can show is that a C infinity generic error preserving map. has an equidistributed sequence of orbit sets. Mm -hmm. And actually the arguments that you use to prove this, it kind of, so a, actually can be directly used to prove a, a very slightly finer statement. So in fact, not only can you prove e generic equidistribution in the set of all area preserving Giffy morphisms, but you can prove them in certain uh, Hamiltonian isotopy classes of area preserving Giffy morphisms. So, so the way I'm going to state this is as, as follows. So. So I'm going to say, suppose phi is a rational area preserving Giffy morphism, which I'll, I'll define explicitly momentarily. But just as a, an example to keep in mind, a if you take a if you, just as an example to keep in mind, if you take sigma to be the two torus, then any Ham, any Diffie morphism which is Hamiltonian isotopic to a rational torus rotation will be rational. Any area preserving map which is Hamiltonian isotopic to an irrational rotation will not be rational. But I'll I'll give a full definition shortly. Okay. But anyways, suppose we just fix some rational map, then then a then for a C infinity generic. Uh, phi, phi prime which is Hamiltonian isotopic to phi, uh, then, then phi prime has an equidistributed of orbit sets. So, this latter result is a bit of a mouthful, but one, one, one elementary corollary is, well, the identity map is rational. So we actually can get equidistribution uh. In, uh, in the class of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. Right, so that's what I mean by this is a slightly finer statement. And w one last thing to note is actually, so the, the first, it would seem like the first theorem, this is a bit of a subtle point. It would seem like the first theorem is a direct corollary of the second theorem. But in fact, rational maps are dense, but not generic in the space of all area preserving diffeomorphisms. 
So it's not actually a direct corollary, but the, the, the exact same arguments work. I mean, what, this is exactly because, you know, the rational, essentially because the rational numbers are dense, but not generic in the reals. Yeah. And let me see one note I should make. So after I, after I posted the first version of this work on the archive, I, I received a, a draft in preparation by uh, at Oliver Etmer and Yan Yao, uh, basically proving the same theorems with uh, pretty much the uh, a similar method. All right, so does anybody have any questions about you know the statements or the basic setup? That's a that's a good question. So you can essentially from you know some algebraic argument, you can't you can't show that just you have a sequence of periodic orbits which equal distribute in, in that sense, but you can show that there's a sequence of equidistributed periodic orbits in some kind of Cesaro summation sense. So mm -hmm. it, might, it might be worth writing this as a corollary, actually. Corollary. Um, so C infinity generic So C infinity generic phi have a sequence Sj of orbit of orbits, not not orbit sets, such that for any f in C infinity of sigma, we have equal distribution in the following sense. So this is S1 of f. So we, we have equal, so this is what I meant by uh, whatever, Cesaro sum. We, if we can produce a sequence of orbits so that if we sum them up in this, if we sum them up in this way and take a limit as n goes to infinity, then we, then we converge to the volume measure. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the argument for this is it's essentially, you know, entirely combinatorial. It's just some algebraic manipulations with the definition of equal distribution up there. Yeah, but that was a good question. Thank you. Um, so ergodicity is something about equal distribution of a single orbit, which is uh, gonna, going to not be closed. Uh, so, so it's slightly different, I would say. But it's a similar, I guess, principle, like a, an average of an orbit an average over an orbit converging to the integral over the whole space. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I my my knowledge of this area is very limited. I'd say. Okay. So, so now now what we're going to do is uh, introduce the basic tool used to prove these theorems, which are PFH spectral invariants, or p coming from periodic flow homology. And I'm just going to very, just outline essentially the very bare bones uh, facts about periodic flow homology and the spectral invariants, because really in the end, we don't use any of the details there. The proof entirely involves certain formal properties of the spectral invariants, as opposed to their actual definitions. And along the way, I will tell you what a rational map is very shortly. So, so periodic flow homology is some kind of flow theory. And it turns out to be con pretty convenient to think of the, the diffeomorphism phi 
as a flow as opposed to you know a diffeomorphism so one way to do that is just is the mapping torus construction so let me fix some um, area preserving map phi then the mapping torus which I'll write as m sub v, is a closed three manifold, which is given by taking the interval across the surface and then just gluing the two ends together with by the map v. Okay. So in 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 our setting, there's a few convenient geometric structures that the mapping torus has. So, so the first thing is that the mapping torus is, actually has a natural stable Hamiltonian structure. So this is given by a pair of the one form of this closed one form dt and a closed two form omega, which I'll write as omega phi. So dt arises from the t coordinate on interval cross surface, so the interval coordinate. And this omega phi comes from the area form. We pull back the area form to interval cross surface. And then since the map phi preserves the area form, this descends to the quotient. OK. The next thing is there's what's called the Rabe vector field, partial t. So this, this is just the vector field induced by the T coordinate. And the important point is that the, the periodic, so the periodic orbits of phi, you can check, are in, are in bijection with periodic orbits of this vector field. And just to set up, just to set up the notation, I'm going to state this in, in a little, I'm just going to state this in terms of orbit sets. So, I'm going to say, so if we take the, or, or, orbit sets theta of phi are going to be in bijection with orbits, or sorry, not theta, O, oh, are going to be in bijection with orbit sets of dt. And if I have an orbit set O of phi, I'm going to write its corresponding orbit set of dt as theta O. Oh. And just to be clear, dt is a vector field, is a vector field on the mapping torus. So just like how just like how O here, this orbit set, is some formal sum of finite collections of points on sigma, this or, the corresponding orbit set theta sub O is going to be some collection, some formal sum of, of uh, just loops in your mapping torus. OK? And now the last thing to keep in mind is that is that the mapping torus fibers over the circle. This is induced by the projection onto the interval upstairs in the interval cross surface. And we'll write V for the vertical tangent bundle. Okay. So now I'm going to, now that I've talked about the mapping torus, I can define what rational means. So, so phi is rational if uh, the two form omega phi, if its if its cohomology class is a real multiple of a rational class. Okay, and. Okay, so that's that's just tying up that loose end. And it's important to, and, and now I'm gonna just give some examples of mapping tori. The main point I wanna make here is that if I have two diffeomorphisms, which differ by a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, then their mapping tori can be identified. So the first, first of these examples, going along the lines of what I just said, is if phi is Hamiltonian, then the mapping torus M sub phi, can be identified with the circle cross sigma. And, 
Uh, and of course, on the right-hand side, circle cross sigma is the mapping torus of the identity. All right, now second, I'm gonna write, write down what I just said. If phi prime is equal to phi, composed with the time one map of a Hamiltonian H, which I'm denoting as C1H, then, then this Hamiltonian H defines some identification MH from M phi to M phi prime. And this, and this map M, MH, uh, and you can actually explicitly compute what this map MH does to the stable Hamiltonian structures. So I can compute the, so I can compute the pullback by MH of the stable Hamiltonian structure on the mapping torus of phi prime. So DT and omega phi prime pull back to a stable Hamiltonian structure DT and then omega phi plus DH wedge DT. So this, this computation brings up a couple of important points. First of all, it tells us that the property of being rational is independent of the Hamiltonian is, is independent, it, or it doesn't change under Hamiltonian isotopy. So it's actually a property of the Hamiltonian isotopy class of map. This is because, you know, the, this is because omega phi prime and omega phi have the same cohomology class. They differ by this exact two form. And the second point of this computation is, well, it, it it's, it's actually important for, it, it's, for the purposes of, of com computing other things related to spectral invariance and so on, it, it's much easier when you're comparing two error preserving maps in, to just identify the mapping tori in some way. And uh, so this is, so this is a, a computation which is you know, fundamental to results about PFH spectral invariance. Well, what do you mean by rational map? Or... Oh, no, no, I think it's uh, unrelated. Well, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, if uh, something in the image of H2MBQ inside H2MV. So in other words, these are two forms which integrate to rational numbers over any integral two-dimensional cycle. Yeah, so so if 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 this cohomology has rank more than one, this is a pretty this is a pretty non-trivial property, being a real multiple of a rational class. But on the other hand, on the other hand, what this tells you is that on the other hand, well, this is kind of a this is kind of a meaning, meaningless point. But what this tells you is, for example, if the surface is S2, then any, any map is rational because this, this, will, this will have rank, rank, at, rank at most one. But um, really any area preserving map of S2 is Hamiltonian. So it's, it's somewhat moot. Okay, so. So now I'm going to talk, just give a very, very brief outline of what periodic flow homology is. And the version of periodic flow homology I'm going to describe is some kind of twisted version, which is useful for defining quantitative invariance. So, so twisted periodic flow homology takes in uh, three, three pieces of data. First is some area preserving map P. Second is some class gamma in H1 of the mapping torus. So some in integral class gamma. And then the third is what's called a trivialized reference cycle. And geometrically, this is just some set of loops which could have multiplicity and they represent 
represent the class gamma. Okay. So with these three pieces of data, you can define some type of some type of fluoromology group called periodic fluoromology. And all I'm going to describe really are the generators of the chain complex for periodic fluoromology. So these are going to be pairs. So generators. So these are going to be pairs, theta w, where, so theta is going to be the following. It's going to be a tuple of pairs gamma sub i, m sub i, where, where each gamma sub i is equal to an embedded orbit of dt. Of DT. So essentially just some simple, it's just, just a simple periodic orbit of, of your map. And then, and then m sub i is a natural number. So this is, this is the multiplicity of your orbit in, in, this, in this set. And um, uh, just as an additional technical condition, you, you always set m sub i to be equal to one when this orbit gamma sub i is hyperbolic. And then the last, the last point is that the, that we, re we require that the sum over i of m sub i gamma sub i is equal to this large class gamma. So the set of all these embedded loops with multiplicity have homology class big gamma. Okay. And so this, this set theta, it, it's a set of loops representing the big class gamma. And theta ref also is a, some set of loops representing the big class gamma. And const, as a consequence, they have some two, you know that there must, by, by definition, there must exist some two chain which uh, in, interpolates between them. And, and this, this thing W is essentially a choice of such a two chain. So more precisely, W is an element of this group. So this is the group of all two chains with boundary theta minus theta ref and modulo so, and you say that any, any two of these two chains are equivalent if they differ by an exact, by a boundary, uh, by a two-dimensional boundary. Okay. And the reason for introducing this kind of uh, interpolating two chain, this anchor, is because it, 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 equips the, it equips PFH with some kind of quantitative structure. So. Okay. So. So this is called the PFH action functional, which is certainly an overused name, but anyways. So the action functional is some functional on the generators. So it takes a pair theta w to the integral over the two chain w of this two form, omega phi, okay? And the point is that this action functional defines a filtration on the fluor chain complex upstairs. And then given a, given a filtered chain complex, there's a natural way of defining, of defining a quantitative invariance. So, so this action functional produces spectral invariance. And so these are some numbers, Let's see sigma, phi, gamma, theta, ref, some real numbers for any, for any non-zero PFH class, sigma. And just to give an informal definition, the way you, these are defined by some kind of variational definition. So this, this non-zero PFH class sigma is defined has ha, can be represented in many ways in the chain complex upstairs as some sum over the generators, and we say that and each of these generators has an action, and we say that this spectral invariant is the is basically the minimum possible action, the minimum L, so that the so sigma has a representative by generators which all have action less than equal to L. So 
even more informally. It's just the minimum action needed to represent sigma. But anyways, as I mentioned uh, shortly, shortly after starting the talk, we're only really going to use formal properties of these spectral invariants, which is, which is what I plan to write down now. And yeah, and I do need to make a couple of notes before doing so. Yeah, it, eventually these will be used to produce the eco distributed orbits. Um, uh, I think maybe once I write down the formal properties, this will make a little more sense. That's correct, and but actually from there it's it's not so it's it's actually pretty immediate almost to pass to uh, equal distributed orbits in the surface. I think just as a example, if M phi is uh, S one across the surface, then maybe this is more clear. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finite formal sum. There's no uh, nothing fancy going on, right? So, yeah. So one thing I wanted to note is if I write, as if I take phi and I compose it with the time one map of a Hamiltonian, then the periodic fluoromology group does not change. So, namely, PFH of phi H and H gamma. Um, H eta ref. So all I've all I've done here is I've you know pushed forward the the PFH data for phi to the mapping torus of of uh, phi H by the relation between the mapping tori. Yeah. So what what I'm saying is that pushing forward the data by a Hamiltonian H does not change PFH. So so what I'll so a convention that I'll follow is that I'll I'll define PFH. I'll, I'll generally fix some like base set of data here. Like I'll fix some base map phi, and then for any for any push forward by Ham Hamiltonian H, you can define spectral invariants for phi H. But I'll do them using using classes that a priori just live in the PFH here, and this this can be done just because these things are are you know canonically isomorphic, in in the appropriate sense. Yeah, so now let's get to some formal properties of PFH spectral invariants. Okay, so let me fix base map D. Okay, so the first formal property is kind of along the lines of what, what Barish was talking about. So this is the, well, I guess what I call the spectrality property. So if phi is rational, then, then what you can show is that any spectral invariant is the action of some, of some PFH generator. So there exists theta w such that such that the spectral invariant C sigma phi gamma theta ref is equal to the action of this generator. Okay. That's the first problem. So, so really, really it's some kind of compactness argument with the with the definition. And so at some point you need uh, at some point, you need rationality for this to work. Um, it's, it's actually, I guess, there's no proofs written down that this works for non-rational maps. The next property is what's called the uh, Hofer-Lipschitz property. And 
basically what this means is that these spectral invariants vary in, vary in like a Lipschitz sense as you change the as you change change the Hamiltonian. So so let me write so just as a piece of notation, I'm going to write d for dt this one form dt paired with gamma. Informally, this is called the degree of the class gamma. Informally, it's just the amount of times gamma winds around the mapping torus. Okay, and so then you have the following estimate. So suppose I have I take c sigma of phi h. I'm just going to yeah or phi h gamma theta ref. Then I I take the difference of that with c sigma of of phi k gamma theta ref. So h and k are just two Hamiltonians, and then there's just some uh, some error term given by integral of h minus k dt over theta ref. So on one hand, this is this is greater than or equal to d times the integral from zero to one of the minimum of h minus k t dt. And on the other hand, well, I ran out of room sideways. On the other hand, this is less than or equal to d times the integral from zero to one of max of h minus k t dt. So why is this called Hofer Lipschitz? Well, roughly what it says is that the, dif the difference in the spectral invariance for h and for phi h and phi k differ uh, very, very differ or have these have these bounds. So they they act like Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constant d for for this for this particular kind of measure of distance between Hamiltonians. So this is this is so these expressions written here are, are very similar to what's called the Hofer distance for for Hamiltonians. Hence why it's called the Hofer Lipschitz. Okay. All right. And now the, the last property is maybe the most complicated. Okay. So, so this is called the Vial Law. So so there's some, so there's a slightly more general version of this, but I'm going to state the following version. So if I take phi rational, and then I take ga gamma, I take a, I'm going to, now I'm going to take a sequence of classes gamma sub m, which are monotone. And I'm going to suppose, so this is just some technical definition. And then I'm going to suppose that d sub m, which are the degrees of these gamma sub m, are increased to increase arbitrarily. And, and now what I'm also going to do is I'm going to define a sequence of classes to define, fix a sequence of classes to define spectral rates. So let me pick some classes sigma sub m and pfh of phi with respect to gamma sub m. And I can just pick some reference cycle status of them. Okay. Then I have the following identity for every H. <sighs> then, yeah. So then for every H, I have the following identity. So, so if I look at the difference between the spectral variance of phi compose of phi H. minus C sigma M phi gamma M theta M plus integral theta M H B T. So if I look at the difference of these spectral invariants with some additional error term given by the integral of H over the reference cycle, and I divide by the degree, then when I take a limit, all I recover on the right-hand side is, is the integral of H. So, so this is some kind of, uh, I guess, this is some kind of precursor, perhaps, to the equidistribution. Roughly, what it says is that the 
you have some sequence of orbit sets whose, uh, whose integrals recover, recover H. No, no, yeah, this is, well, it's, well, it's relatively new. So yeah, I was, I was actually gonna go over roughly when all these properties were proved. Yeah, so the spectrality and Hofer-Lipschitz properties were done in work of uh, Christopher Gardner, Humilier, and Seifedini, uh, I guess maybe last year. And then the Weil law, um, so then this was work of myself, uh, Christopher Gardner and uh, Bo Yu Zhang, as well as so, and then Edmar and Hutchings also have a vial law, I guess, with some additional U cyclic condition on these classes. But actually, I think what we now know is that any class over Z over Z two with Z two coefficients is U cyclic. So uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, it's 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 essentially this it's the same statement over Z two. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. So now that we have all this basic setup out of the way, we can uh, start to we can give some kind of sketch of the proof of this theorem. Okay. Yeah. Um. I think so the there's a lot of um, so very broadly I can tell you about the way we do it. I don't I I'm, I'm much less familiar with the way Oliver and Michael think about it but um it, it so ECH is so the way it's done for ECH is ECH is isomorphic to some to some flavor of Cyberguidin monopole theoremology and you can add some kind there's some kind of quantitative version of this uh, of this isomorphism and which you can analyze to prove to basically compute the spectral invariance up to some order, up to some error, and show that they converge to the volume. And yeah, and it's kind of a it's kind of a similar story here, in that there's PFH is also isomorphic to an, a different flavor of monopole fluoromology, and you can again do some kind of quantitative analysis. But I would say just the the setups are the setups are very different. So for example, ECH is, uh, is actually infinitely generated. Like it, it has these U towers um, and, and uh, that's not true for PFH. And so what, what happens is, for example, this idea of taking many sequences of classes does not show up in the ECH setting. So basically like, so these classes are all coming from different PFH groups, right? We can't pick a, an infinite sequence of classes in a single PFH group. So, so that's very, yeah, so that's very broadly the, uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot of differences in the setup. Yeah, so does anybody have any other questions? Okay, so let me state the main, main technical proposition. And the theorem's really, the theorems real the the main theorems really follow with uh, like some basic arguments from this main proposition. So suppose D is rational, and I fix some um, finite set f one through f n of smooth smooth functions on the mapping torus. Then what I know is for C infinity dense Hamiltonians H. Uh, phi H has an has an orbit set. Oh, for C infinity dense H, and this is some kind of estimate, so we're fixing some epsilon big and zero. But so we know that phi H has an orbit set set O such that well. Basically, O is O is some kind of nearly equidistributed orbit set in the mapping torus. So the averages of these f sub i over O are very close to the integral of f sub i over the mapping torus. So just to write this down, so for every i, 
from 1 to n, we have that the following is true. If we take the average over O of the integral of F sub i, then it's very close, epsilon close to the integral of epsilon. So just to be entirely clear, this, this second term is the integral of this smooth function on the mapping torus. And this expression here is the following. Well, the orbit set O gives you just some set of loops inside your mapping torus. And you can certainly integrate you know, fi dt over these things. And then you divide by the size of the orbit set. And this is like the, this is just the average of f sub i over this over the orbit set. So this proposition is what this proposition is doing is it's producing nearly equidistributed orbits in the in the mapping torus. And then from here, the uh, yeah, and then and then from here, you know, you can. And, and from here, the point is that, well, you can produce some c infinity dense set of H. There, there's some C infinity dense set of H such that phi, the perturbation phi H is nearly equidistributed. And you can do this, you know, you can do this for any finite set of functions. You can do this for any epsilon. And then it's some kind of a bare category theorem. So what you, what you do is you can take some sequence of epsilon N going to zero. You can take some C zero dense sequence of functions, some countable C0 dense sequence of functions. And then you just do some kind of intersection over all sets of Hamiltonians, which have nearly, nearly equal distributed orbit sets. And this gives you the, the main theorem. So, I mean, where does the gen genericity come from? Because a countable intersection of dense sets is not going to be dense. The genericity comes from just the fact that you can actually make these orbit sets non-degenerate by a tiny Hamiltonian perturbation. So that once, once you know you can produce a non-degenerate orbit set produce, satisfying these conditions, then you get an open dense set instead. Yeah, so that's a, so this is just some kind of quick rundown to you know, convince you at least that this has some relation to proving the main theorem. Okay. Right, so yeah, so now let me, let me, so now the plan is to just to give a sketch of the proof of the proposition. And, and uh, I should be very clear that essentially the proof of this proposition follows very, it follows very closely the, you know, anal it follows very closely analogous results established by, uh, established by Marcus Nevis and Song for an equidistribution result for minimal hypersurfaces. As well as uh, K, as well as K Erie for equal distribution results for rate flows. The the essentially the, the essentially new input are you know some some important computations as well as you know these formal properties of PFH spectral invariance, which were only recently established. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to actually consider Hamiltonian perturbations essentially by these, by these functions f sub i themselves. So let's fix phi and, and also some Hamiltonian h. Now for, for any parameter tau in the cube zero one to the n, we can define a family, we can define a family of Hamiltonians. So we can write h sub tau is equal to the sum is equal to h plus the sum over i of tau sub i f sub i. Okay. And so let's let's see, let's see what the formal properties of PFH spectrum variance actually tell us about the spectral invariance over along this family. So, so we can define. So let's let's fix just some class, let's fix some data of classes gamma sub m. And sigma sub m, as in the Vala. And then we'll define some uh, 
quote unquote error functions. So these are just going to be these are just going to be you know normalized normalized error terms in the vial law. So I'm going to write e sub m of tau to be equal to the following quantity. So I'm going to take one over d sub m. Remember, this is the degree of the class gamma sub m uh, times this times uh, you know the so this is basically just the left hand side of the vial law. So c sigma sub m v e h tau minus c sigma sub m v plus integral theta m h tau v t. And then I'm going to also, and then I'm going to just subtract off the integral of h tau. Okay. So what does what does the vial law tell us about these? So what do the what does the vial law tell us about these formal about these error functions? So what the vial law tells us tells us is that the limit is that the limit as m goes to infinity of e sub m is equal to zero pointwise. This is this is just a rearrangement of the statement in the vial law. And then, but then the, but what we also know by the Hofer Lipschitz estimate is that actually these e sub m are going to be uniformly Lipschitz functions on this on this cube zero one to the n. So we get that limit as m goes to infinity of e sub m is equal to zero uh, uniformly, just from combining this pointwise statement and the Hofer Lipschitz property. Okay. And Okay, and, and now let me just give a sketch sketch of an argument in in a in a simple case. So this is this is the part that follows the the other results that I mentioned earlier for minimal hypersurfaces and for rate flows. So simple case. So suppose we know a little more about these E sub m, which is not true in practice. So each E sub m is C1. And just as a technical condition, and each B and each uh, B H tau is uh, non degenerate. Okay, so so then. So if, if each of these, if, if, if we have this condition, then we can actually compute the derivative of these error functions at, at, any, at any tau. So, so this, is, this follows from the spectrality property. This is, so for every i and tau in zero one, we can actually compute the derivative of the error function in the ith direction. So d tau sub i, Em of tau is equal to the following. So there, there exists some orbit set O, or yeah, there exists some, or yeah, yeah. So there exists some orbit set O such that the derivative is equal to this quantity. So this is so this so this is actually exactly the quantity that we want to show is small in the main proposition, and and then so then to conclude the proof in this simple case, well, all we want to show is that we can actually find some tau, so that so that the derivatives some tau and some sufficiently large m, so that the derivatives of these this this error function are very small, less than epsilon, and you know if the and. Just heuristically, if each we know that these converge uniformly to zero in in C zero, so we can take some we can take some m, so that e sub m is very is uniformly very small everywhere, and then if it's very small everywhere and it's C one, then there should be some point at which it has small derivatives, 
And that, that, that concludes the proof of the proposition in this case. And in the general, so uh, I'm, I'm out of time, uh, of course. Uh, you use it in this computation. Yeah, you, you, I mean, what non-degeneracy tells you is not only do you have spectrality, you have some orbit set, but kind of locally, for like locally nearby, all the spectral invariants are represented by some smoothly moving family of, uh, of uh, PFH generators. Yeah, yeah, but it, the way to get this in the general case is that even if the E sub M aren't C1, they are uniformly Lipschitz. So they will have many, many differentiable points. And moreover, uh, and, and you can you you can't guarantee this non-degeneracy condition, of course, but you can always you know kind of see infinity perturb your family, so that almost so that almost all of these maps B H tau are non-degenerate, and that's that's roughly how you and then this introduces some additional complications, but that's that's roughly how you proceed in, for the general case. All right, so I'm sorry I. I guess I ended up a couple minutes over time. Thank you all for your patience. And oh, okay. Uh, no, it, it's it's perfectly fine. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Uh, will answer also results if you have boundary. Um, it's a little, it's a little tricky. For this, because you can you can talk about you can define say spectral invariance for um, compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms just by embedding it in some closed surface and extending by the identity. No, but I mean, uh, if you actually have something non-trivial happen on the boundary, so. Oh but, yeah, um, that's I think so. Um, I've been working out some details related to compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. Nothing definite, but um, if there's non-trivial boundary behavior, then I can say I have no idea. I think probably you could do something like this if it's say a disk map and it's a rotation near the boundary. Yeah, so you know, if you, uh, on the boundary itself, uh, has some rotation number and then maybe you want to keep this fixed. And make things uh, generic otherwise. Yeah, 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 right. All right, thank you all for listening. <laughs>